WP. Good afternoon. I hope everyone has been enjoying the expo and all the good sessions today and lots more to come. Um, up next, we have leveraging existing organizational knowledge with augmented reality. Please join me um, welcoming to the stage Michael Hinckley, Senior Systems Engineering Manager at Northrop Grumman, and Scott Montgomery, co-founder and CEO of Scope AR. All right. How's it going? I'm going well, Scott. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. All right. So just as a quick introduction, uh, what Scope AR does is uh, we're all about the digital thread. And uh, so what that means is broadly that you know, for any sufficiently complex product, it goes through the same set of phases. So first you, you design it, usually in, in CAD or PLM. Then you go out into the market and you buy the, the nuts and bolts of what you're going to build. And then you actually build it. And once you build it, you sell it. And once you sell it, it breaks, and then you fix it. And then rinse and repeat until the end of life. And then you go back to the beginning with a brand new product. So what our product does is uh, enables that at scale. So you can bring in your CAD, PLM um, uh, objects into WorkLink Create. WorkLink Create is a really easy to use, uh, no code platform for creating augmented reality instructions. That allows you to publish out to the WorkLink CMS securely. So we handle users, um, uh, uh, data management. Uh, and then you publish out to your app. And uh, so this is where your frontline workers can take advantage of uh, all the amazing power that we all know that augmented reality can provide. And then finally, there's a robust integration ecosystem of manufacturing execution systems, or IoT, or learning management systems, or field service management systems, to be able to you know, integrate that with a company's existing systems. So that's really what the, you know, the WorkLink uh, platform provides. Uh, now turn it over to Michael. He was here a couple years ago, and here's the reprise. Yeah, great, Scott. Yeah, so where, where have we been over the last couple of years? We've gone from single use case to full deployment out on production lines on multiple programs across the enterprise. And that's been an, uh, not a short road. There's a lot of work going on with that. But the partnerships that we have with Scope, the no-code solution that we have has been really easy for us to go uh, scale uh, rapidly and deploy out on production. So our technicians are using these products on our floor and on our programs across the enterprise. And it's been... Uh, results have been pretty phenomenal to date. We've seen anything from 15 to 40 percent uh, reduction at direct touch labor, and there's obviously a lot of use cases and efficiencies that we're still uh, tackling. Uh, and then there's the flexibility working with Scope as a partner to kind of shape where the industry is going. Uh, so solutions that are out of the box um, that aren't completely tailored to our needs, we work with our partnership through our partnership to go um, tailor the product. Perfect. So I want to kind of start off this discussion by talking about um, you know, the skills gap. So we're hearing this a lot across uh, virtually every industry. Um, you know, when I talk to, to Fortune 500 CEOs, you know, your, your leadership, um, you know, there's a major, major problem in terms of uh, the ability to attract new workers, um, to keep you know, the existing workforce uh, as efficient as possible, and then attrition is a huge problem. You know, one Fortune 500 CEO uh, in, in your space told me the last year that they lost uh, double digits, so over 10% of their workforce, and they just don't know where they went. You know, they didn't know if they retired or, or went to competitors or whatever, but it's a massive loss of labor. And uh, you know, this study up here uh, basically says that this is a huge concern. This is number two after uh, inflation uh, in terms of you know, the risks to, to business. So I want to ask you, uh, how have you guys been affected uh, in your industry by, by the skills gap? And uh, you know, what effect has that had on your business and productivity? Yeah, I mean, during, during the times of the pandemic, pandemic and COVID, it was tough to even get people into work. Obviously, the work that we do is in restricted spaces, so there's not a lot of choice um, coming in and, and working at the product. Um, but there's a lot of things that uh, this technology brings to bear. What I like to call instant experts is people coming right into the job place in new markets can come on and feel comfortable about doing the work uh, and doing it right the first time uh, using augmented reality and, and the scope solution. So... Uh, it hasn't affected our company. We're really good at hiring and, and retaining talent, uh, I think, but there were definitely some labor challenges and, you know, being able to use XR and augmented reality to do training uh, at our facilities pre-people ever going out on product has been a big benefit for us. And then to see the benefits of um, the touch labor and quality savings that we've seen and the confidence that it gives the workers, right, as they put the devices on and can feel free to walk through the work instruction uh, and, and, and do it right the first time. So, so why did you choose uh, augmented reality as a solution to, to this problem? It's really hard to do uh, work with your, with your hands constrained by paper documents. I mean, we're, we're in the digital age, right? So 
it's also really hard to do complex um, jobs where you can't really see something behind another object or using a 2D drawing. So having that 3D overlay uh, and actually walking them through the work instructions, some of which are very complex and long, would be maybe 10 documents or 100 documents can now be visualized, right? Yeah. yeah. Pretty powerful. So you know, all of our customers that have been successful um, you know, really started a why, or with, with you know, the why. You know, innovation for innovation's sake, adopting new technology just because it's cool, it never works out. So what was your why? The why it becomes down to getting a product out, uh, first time quality and with speed, right? Uh, near peer competitors and the challenges that we see in the world, our customer demands um, things being done right the first time and uh, at a relatively fast pace. So using augmented reality uh, has really kind of filled a gap for us where uh, we, can, we can bring people right out to the line and get them to work on day one yeah. uh, using the technology. Very cool. And so how, how is you know, uh, your ability to you know, adopt this technology and be a, a thought leader affected you know, your ability to go capture new business? Uh, has that been a huge advantage? Yeah, it always gives you a competitive advantage as our customers are driving um, this for the same solutions that we're driving for. Uh, so we're always trying to be competitive and, and win new contracts uh, for our company. Uh, um, yeah. Great. Great. So we, we know that you guys have seen some incredible results uh, and value from you know, the, the augmented reality solution. You can't provide any you know, in-depth details, but I'd love to see if we can dive into you know, one use case, uh, as much detail as you can provide um, to kind of give the audience some idea around what you guys do. Yeah, you mentioned it at the beginning of the last question, is you always have to have a business case. Of course, we're always doing research and, and development and innovation, but it has to land on a product and it has to have return on investment, either in direct touch labor savings, in speed, quality, or ease of use uh, for a person. Uh, and we've seen great tangible results there uh, with these types of technologies. Perfect. So subsystems, uh, coatings, applications, uh, remote assistance, remote SME, um, training has been big for us, uh, so I, I mean I could go on and on for about an hour of the, the use cases <laughs> as hardware and gets better, um, the aperture uh, gets wider. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you mentioned something, you, you got some like, you know, 100 uh, work instructions on the, on Hun hundreds, hundreds? hundreds of work instructions yeah. on, on programs to date, uh, programs of, of record, uh, and that continues to scale uh, pretty rapidly as we um, we kind of fine tune the technology to hit the tolerances that we need, opens up the aperture for more work instructions out on the floor. Yeah, it's, it, you know, we're kind of seeing a flywheel, right? Where you started with a small team and then they're training more people and more people and more people and it's kind of you know, finding better success and kind of growing, so. One, one, work in, one work instruction, one use case is now hundreds of wor work instructions uh, out on the factory floor. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, cool, so um, what are two or three key things that you, know, you would say are needed to keep your team motivated and, and engaged in, in uh, rapidly you know, developing and, and deploying uh, augmented reality solutions? Uh, our team's definitely uh, very engaged in the work they do, uh, excited about uh, where the industry is, is, is headed and what it does for, for the line. A lot of the folks that work on the team have been you know, previously manufacturing engineers doing kind of the traditional ways of, of doing business is now bringing in um, the new way of doing business with, with XR. Uh, so it wasn't really hard. Uh, it's not hard to get our customers uh, on board with what we're doing as you go, you know, I always go say, put on the device and let them see the world, yeah. right? Yeah. And that gets them very excited about what the possibilities um, are for, for, for Northrop Grumman and for, for the customer base. So it really hasn't been tough. And then as, w as we see the kind of savings that we're seeing, out on product that's not reoccurring, right? It's per, per ship. Uh, there's huge, huge benefits um, from the cost side to the company. That's awesome. Yeah, there's nothing quite like seeing is believing, right? Get the device on and you know, seeing it. Seeing, I know, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing, absolutely. I, I gotta be honest, one of the coolest moments of my life was when you know, I was on your factory floor and you know, saw what you were doing. And um, you know, 10 years ago when, when I started working on this, I imagined I could maybe fix cars with this, but it, it was, that was a pretty mind-blowing moment. So that, that was pretty cool. It's been it's been very easy. Yeah, uh, yeah, for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I mean, your team, uh, you know, amazing people. But you know, getting them to work on this really cool stuff, you know, not hard to, to motivate them, right? And to be the first, <laughs> right? They're yeah. really excited about being the first, and then sharing that knowledge across the company, uh, getting others excited about what we're doing. Big, 
big cadre of, of our team out here meeting together and talking about all of the possibilities and, and programs that we want to go support. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, based on your experience, I mean, you guys are, are very experienced. Um, how quickly do you think a new team, you know, spinning up from scratch, um, can actually realize value? Like days, weeks, months? Um, like, yeah, what's the time to value for? It, for it depends on the, the program, but we, We've, the work that we've done, the team has just been phenomenal. It's something that could be lifted and shifted into any program um, from, uh, you know, the hardware and what, what's needed to actually go do the work uh, to actually the IT infrastructure uh, that's going on behind the scenes, the communication, the training. We've gotten it into our training facility now, so when new technicians come in to Northrop Grumman on day one, they're training on HoloLenses. They won't know anything different, right? As the paper world disappears, um, we're ready to go. So it's been... Pretty, pretty neat to watch the team do a lot of hard work to help the other teams get ready to go on day one. So it's not years, it could, it could be much shorter than the couple of year timeline that we've been on. Yeah, so, for sure, yeah. yeah. So just like that flywheel is getting faster and faster. It's getting faster, getting more, faster more and faster. Value. Yeah, great. So we, we keep hearing a lot about digital thread from you guys and how important that is to maintain. Uh, so, you know, digital thread being, you know, the, the idea that, you know, from, um, uh, you know, soup to nuts from, you know, the, the original CAD, PLM, all the way through the life cycle of, of the product is super important to maintain. Um, can you elaborate why that's so important to you and your business? Our customers expect the whole product and when you don't start early in the life cycle in your PLM, uh, they, don't, they don't have that. They have a broken model that they can't, they can't use, right? Yeah. Imagine in the future you're wearing an end user device and you're out on a flight line and you're looking at a product and it, it came in from a bird strike and you wanted to see every tag that's ever been and you point at that section of the aircraft and your digital thread is complete. They would know every tag that's ever been and can make a quick disposition and get that back into the fleet. That's very powerful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then, yeah, I'm just me. Yeah, I'm maintaining that, uh, that that the flow of information. You, you know, you know, specifically that one bolt that, that came loose and where it was manufactured and who, who was manufactured, who put it in. Uh, you know, all of that, right? Yeah, deep diving back through the supply chain. Yep. Who installed? You know, every yep. every fingerprint uh, of the parts life cycle from the digital conception out to the, the physical product. And so, so how does, um, you know, the, the, the flow of software, I mean, they, you, you guys string together a ton of different softwares um, from, you know, PLM to, to the, you know, to our solution with augmented reality, to IoT, to your MES, to, you know, to all the integrations to, you know, make that work. So, so, you know, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, uh, how that flow of information works and how you, how you manage that. Modeling that helps, <laughs> right? <laughs> we, yeah. do, we do a lot of uh, cameo modeling and making sure that, uh, the systems can talk, right? We can out, uh, go out to the line now and wirelessly download yeah. uh, a work instruction straight from MES, which is the latest and greatest, so that the technician or worker out on the factory floor uh, doesn't get an old model. So there's been a lot of work on the system side um, to go do that uh, in an environment like ours uh, that's in mostly restricted and behind firewalls. You have a lot of people involved in doing that, so a lot of hard work and and, and, and discussions and kind of bantering back and forth to kind of get a solution that is complete. And that's where the work needs to start is early in the PLM uh, life cycle and we're looking to automate a lot of that work um, to reduce labor even further or in, in early on. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, I mean, the time savings is, is definitely on, on the back end, right? You're putting all that work up front, but you know, you know, obviously the savings you guys are seeing in the back end, that's where you realize the real value, right? Yeah, and setting, <laughs> setting, setting the system up so that when you get through the life cycle from engineering to, to, to product out on the floor to sustainment, um, that there's some level of reuse of the data, right? So that you're not cr creating something from scratch yeah, each time. Yeah, absolutely. You can build that library up and the, the competency and the, all the systems. and Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, I mean, going forward, where do you see this going? Uh, I, I mean, it's the future. It's already going, uh, and we can see it just over the last 10 years. The talks, $36 billion. I mean, the market uh, is incredible, and people are excited about what they see. We were talking about people not being able to use the water fountain out there. Wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if they had a QR code that they could just scan, and they got to how to go use the, 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 water, <laughs> the water machine, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, instant, it's instant information, and we see it, we see it today in our, in our cell phones, right? The iPhone started as, as four apps and was pretty much useless, and now it's a supercomputer, right? Absolutely. At, at your fingertips, and it manages your whole life. Yeah. Some, some good, some bad, but mostly good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who out there uh, struggled with the water fountain? Anybody? 
Yeah, me too. It, it took me like five minutes to figure out that stupid foot pedal. <laughs> <laughs> we need a QR code on there to, you know, to build the work instructions for, you exactly. know, for uh, the water fountain. Awesome. Uh, well, I've been doing a lot of talking. Uh, you got anything you want to ask me? Yeah, I mean, where do you, where do you see the XR market uh, over the next few years kind of headed in the industry as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, um, personally, I've been doing this for uh, well, way too long, 12 years now, I think, 13 maybe. This is my 11th Augmented World Expo, so, uh, you know, accounting for pandemic, uh, that, that's a lot. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's been great. But, I mean, right now, I mean, I think we're, we're seriously at an inflection point. The, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, uh, anybody who's been in this space as, as long as I have has kind of been frustrated with the pace of development. Uh, I mean, we had Google Glass back in, you know, eight years ago now, which is like an eternity, and, and we thought that AR glasses were going to be ubiquitous shortly thereafter, and here we are, and, you know, that's not quite the case. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, what Qualcomm announced the last couple of days that we were part of uh, with the, the, the Spaces initiative, uh, that's really cool. You know, I like to think about that as like, you know, the Android of, of augmented reality. If we think about, you know, how um, you know, iOS started, they brought out the iPhone, and then Android kind of made it easy for, for um, uh, other uh, OEMs to go out and create uh, glasses. That's really what, you know, that, that, it, it, that's what the industry needs, and that's what Qualcomm's providing, and they're kind of uniquely positioned to do that. So uh, I love that. You know, Apple's doing something really cool next week. We'll see what happens there. So I just see, you know, I see a, a critical mass of things that, that have happened, and, you know, there's just so much stuff that it has, you know, precursors to get this accepted in industry. I mean, you had to have the devices, you had to have the technology, uh, you had to have, you know, the, uh, the use cases, the numbers that came out that, uh, you know, allowed executives to realize that this was a technology that um, really did produce results and it was viable at scale. And um, then, you know, you had solutions like ours that had to make it easy to scale content. So just a whole lot of building blocks had to, had to come in. But I think all that's ready to rock. And, you know, you guys are kind of, you know, case study in, in proving out that at scale this is, you know, massive and saving. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about, uh, you know, the state of the industry. And then you look at what's going on with AR, or sorry, AI, um, the other A. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're a content generation platform and, um, you know, uh, ChatGPT and DALI and all these things are also content generation things. So what can AI do there? Um, and I, I think there's a, a possibility to you know, really speed up that, that content generation. So, yeah, this is just going to, you know, I think really take off. And I, you know, I've been seeing this for years, but this time I'm right. We are at an inflection point. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody with me? I, I heard a lot of nervous laughs in the audience. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Innovation will keep will keep moving, right? And the world will keep moving. And like I said you know, yesterday in the, in the talks, you're either on the train of innovation and and you're moving with it, or you're watching it go by and waving as it goes by. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been here a couple couple of years, and I've seen the the floor get much larger and a lot of new startups. Uh, where do you where do you see that going? I haven't seen a lot of consolidation, and I'm not saying don't don't continue to uh, start up companies and, and innovate because that's really important. But where do you see some of the larger companies kind of bubbling to the surface and starting to work together on uh, kind of powering up? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, uh, so yeah, all, all these you know small companies out there are kind of working on on pieces of the pie, um, and uh, so you've got you know your your computer vision solutions, you've got you know some interesting you know uh, UX uh, solutions, uh, you've got you know all the hardware uh, startups uh, and, and you know trying to trying to build hardware pieces of hardware like you know um, and over the years we saw a really interesting um, uh, mechanisms for tracking like you know arm armbands and, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, you know I, 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 this is all um, an Ecosystem and all these things are important. Like I said earlier, the building blocks need to be there. Um, I think you know, from from a, a, a software perspective, it's the guys that you know are able to to rapidly scale content and then integrate with existing systems that are going to be able to to you know really um, capture the market. Um, and uh, you know, you can't just go in and, and um, you know sell. You know, everybody can do AR these days. You know, uh, throw a, throw a CAD model in there and you know make a dance around or something like that. But you know, make it ex working with existing systems. The the um, you know, the PLMs, the FSMs, the MESs, working with large companies like yours to realize that value and maintain the digital, digital thread. Um, you know, I think that's a pretty huge competitive advantage and might be a little uh, you know, uh, uh, self-serving there, but I think that's definitely where things go. So, <clears throat> what, do you, what do you think? Uh, I, I mean, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what, what the future holds. I mean, I imagine just like self-driving cars are getting better each day, uh, so will the devices, and eventually the devices will be the inspector, right? So yeah. you not only completed the work uh, using the device, using a solution like Scope AR, but now you're using the device 
uh, to buy off the job and keep the, and then you talk about PLMs and MESs, you take that data and you push it up back into your into your system, and that's now part of your ship's record, right? Yeah, which sure. I think is critical for sustainment of uh, our products in the future. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much other cool stuff you can do. I mean, you know, I th we're just scratching the surface of, you know, all these other things that, you know, maybe AI can do. I know we're working with your team on, on some AI stuff around, you know, uh, object detection and, you know, uh, working on the factory floor and, you know, making sure it's clean and stuff like that. And I think there's thousands of other, you know, ideas around kind of you know, small problems that can be solved on the factory floor and tie into this, right? So I think there's still tons of opportunity for innovation. Yeah, there's so still, <laughs> there's, a lo there's a long road to go there, right? And, yeah. And, and using the devices themselves to kind of understand the, the the space that they're in and recognize how the space should be yeah. uh, is powerful, right? Keeping keeping thought off of our products, right, is the the HoloLens is scanning, right, and it's picking up and detecting things that shouldn't be there. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. For anybody that don't doesn't know, uh, FOD is foreign object debris. Yep. Debris. So it's like you know a gum wrapper or a, uh, um, you know, a nut a nut or a bolt or something like that. And you know when you're building space shuttles or you know high velocity aircraft, that stuff can you know literally take down an aircraft. So kind of important to keep off the factory floor, right? Yeah. We yeah. Do, we deliver FOD free products. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know every sign on that you know massive you know ten foot uh, yeah, signs ten across the factory signs. floor, FOD free area. <laughs> or thousands lines of on the floor. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, Lots yeah. Of training. Yeah, yeah, you know, thousand days FOD free, right? Yep. You know, no, 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 what if you forgot that training, right? You could visualize that in AR. Yeah, actually. absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, yeah. What can't you visualize in AR? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So where do we go from here? Uh, you know, it's 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 hard to know what the future holds, but we're going to keep pressing to uh, to scale to scale in our company because we we've, we've seen the results. Our customers are happy with what we're doing internally and externally. Uh, and we're on, you know, we're on that, that train of innovation, um, really looking for that, that step function change in manufacturing is, is really important for us. So, uh, you know, this is just one tool in, in, in many of the things that we do uh, to kind of change how we do business. Perfect. Awesome. Well, uh, anything you want to ask? You want to get the audience to ask us questions? Any questions? Got the, uh, one of the most uh, forward-looking thought leaders in the, in the room in the manufacturing space. So, uh, all right. Uh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a question about um, kind of uh, sort of DOT military spook kind of scenarios like offensive, defensive, cyber ops, where um, a lot of the XR products that are kind of coming out kind of are fundamentally incompatible with air gapped networks, for instance. Sure. Um, is that. Um, a fundamental kind of showstopper for getting XR deployed in some of those TS and higher clearance required air gap network situations? Or um, is there more um, fungibility there with, you know, like some product that has blockchain staple to the side of it just because or for monetary or for monetization reasons? Do, you, do those products have to kind of have a separate version for those DOD military kind of deployment scenarios where so they can work on an air gapped network? Or is there some fungibility there that's different than the way that technology products had to kind of fit in like kind of square peg, square hole to for air gap networks, TS clearance, like a whole bunch of fundamental stuff. It seems like a lot of the XR products are the way that their their business model is set up and the way that they're monetized is sort of incompatible with those, those scenarios. Is, is there any kind of insight that you have there or about those kinds of scenarios or what products can't should or shouldn't do to be deployable inside of those scenarios? No, it's a great question, and unfortunately, I can't answer a whole bunch of it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, what out of acronyms? <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> It's all possible, um, but what I would say is don't just settle for what's out on the market, and that's why we're working with partners like Scope and Microsoft and other companies to start shaping products for the defense industry, right? Because if you've only made your product for uh, the commercial market, then you've missed the whole market and where we're going. So you're talking about BAA and TAA compliant nations, right? And kind of what's what's happening with the, the Biden Chips Act and things like that, right? Some of the reasons why we want to do some of the manufacturing here. So we definitely we definitely bring that up with the suppliers as we have to go do very custom tweaks to ever see a device in a restricted space, if at all. Um, and so I'd rather have a product come 
off the market that the customers would want to go adopt, right, from day one. Uh, thanks for uh, coming up here. Uh, besides the obvious things like case studies and use cases, what are the biggest barriers to adoption in this XR space for a lot of these, um, for a lot of organizations? Again, besides the obvious stuff like, what's a use case? How much money am I going to make? Time save? Like, are you seeing like techno technological apprehension? What's up for you? Well, what was the last part? Are you seeing technological well, apprehension? Like, apprehension? Like, is it like, oh, I don't know VR? What are the What are the reasons that people are so apprehensive to adopt? Well, they've been that They've been that way historically, right? I mean, you, yeah. you you saw it. You know, took a took a class in college called the uh, Revenge of the Nerds, and it was based on the history of the personal computer, right? You saw kind of the rise and fall of IBM because they were just too good for their own britches, and you've seen that with you know digital photography and Kodak and. Uh, you're going to change, and you're going to change with the market, and you're going to change with the world. Uh, and there's going to be the naysayers, right? Uh, they're going to be the ones that get, get, get passed by. Um, we, we have community of practice within our companies, right, to share best practices. We share out as much as, as we can uh, so that other people can leverage the technologies we developed. Uh, there's always like a generational gap, right, with technologies, but even some of the, the kind of... Um, more uh, seasoned individuals, well, I thought I put it on silent, but I guess not, uh, e even, even see benefit to the products that we're bringing out on the floor. And it's really about spending, spending time with those folks uh, and kind of seeing what their, what their challenges and issues are. And, and more, than, more than not, I mean, we, what, we, what we've done with AR is we survey every person. So we've trained over 400 technicians, it might be more, could be like around 500. Uh, and we asked them, what, what do you like? What don't you like? What are some challenges? What are some things that would benefit? And no kidding, uh, the, these are, this is documentation we collect. 99% of the time, they like what we're delivering down to the floor. So when we're making sure when we're delivering these technologies that they're integrated and they work a uh, first time around, uh, and so that really helps and that you have all of the stakeholders, right? Because it's a big, it's a big community. It's just not the creators, right? It's all the people behind the scenes on the IT side. It's security side. It's networks. It's, it's, an, it's an ecosystem. It's, it's massive. And so we make sure we bring those folks in early on, right? And address any concerns as we're working through the solution space. All right. Well, I think uh, that's a wrap. And uh, oh, we'll, we'll come talk to you afterwards. They're going to throw us off the stage here. So, uh, but yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, it's, been, it's been great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you. That's been awesome.